Good morning. It is Friday, September 18th, 2020. You can now relax and be informed. Here is your daily bite of news. Hurricane Sally unloaded 20 to 30 inches of rain, unleashing wind gusts over 100 miles per hour and generating a six-foot storm surge along the Florida Panhandle and Alabama coast, and its remnants are marching through the southeast, dumping more flooding rain. But forecasters are already turning their attention to two more threatening tropical weather systems, Hurricane Teddy and a disturbance in the Gulf of Mexico that could earn the name Wilfred. There is some chance Teddy could strike Bermuda and then northern New England toward the middle of next week, while the Gulf system could be a problem for coastal Texas and the northern Gulf Coast around the same time. A senior U.S. envoy, Keith Kroc, Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, arrived in Taiwan on Thursday to attend a memorial service for former President Li Tenghui in the Trump administration's latest move to bolster its support of the island in defiance of threats from Beijing. The State Department said that the focus of Mr. Kroc's visit was the memorial service for Mr. Li, who led the Taiwan from dictatorship to democracy, but the Taiwanese government said that the envoy would also be discussing economic issues. Last month, the United States announced that it was establishing a new economic dialogue with Taiwan focused on technology, healthcare, energy, and other sectors. Taiwan hopes talks will result in a free trade agreement with the United States. The Trump administration has also stepped up military support for Taiwan in recent years through increased arms sales. It is pushing the sale of seven large packages of weapons to Taiwan, including missiles that would allow Taiwanese jets to hit Chinese targets in the event of a conflict. Mr. Kroc will meet with President Tsai Ing-wen on Friday. China, which claims self-governed Taiwan as its territory and opposes formal exchanges of any kind, responded to the news of Mr. Kroc's visit on Wednesday by sending two anti-submarine aircraft into the island's air defense zone, according to the Taiwanese Defense Ministry, but the planes were warned off by Taiwanese Air Force. Since 2017, up to 3 million Uyghur Muslims in China's western Xinjiang province have been plucked from their homes by authorities and disappeared into prison labor camps, which the Chinese government glosses over with the term re-education facility. Of increasing concern is the notion that the Uyghurs are being subjected to brutal and coercive family planning policies, including forced sterilizations and implantations of IUDs in Uyghur women and forced abortions indicating China's intent to significantly reduce, if not eliminate, the Uyghur population. But as evidence unravels of mass human rights violations, the Trump administration is said to be contemplating labeling the Chinese Communist Party's oppression of the Uyghur minority as genocide, as evidence continues to mount. In a new Heritage Foundation report entitled Why the U.S. Should Issue an Atrocity Determination for Uyghurs, a potent case is made for the U.S. government to issue an atrocity declaration on the Chinese government. The Heritage report lists steps that the U.S. and the broader international community can take in the march towards some semblance of justice and accountability. The report calls for the U.S. to issue an atrocity determination to grant priority to refugee status to Uyghur refugees, identify additional government officials and individuals in China eligible for sanctioning for their human rights violations, and create and appoint a special coordinator for Xinjiang at the State Department. The report also calls for the U.S. to publicly request the International Olympic Committee review China's suitability to host the 2022 Olympics. Deputy Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen said in a memo on Thursday that federal prosecutors should consider charging violent protesters under a criminal sedition law, which doesn't require proof that they were plotting to overthrow the government. The federal statute governing sedition charges applies to other acts, including preventing law enforcement officers from carrying out their duties and forcibly taking property belonging to the government. The guidance marks a move by the Justice Department to use federal prosecutions against violent demonstrators when state and local officials decline to bring charges. Rosen said the seditious conspiracy statute is one of several federal offenses that prosecutors should consider in charging defendants involved in riots. Rosen's boss, William Barr, last week pushed U.S. attorneys to pursue sedition counts. 
the United Nations General Assembly typically draws world leaders and philanthropists from all over the globe, packing New York City with their entourages. At the 75th edition of the annual event, however, there won't be a single one. All other world leaders have already announced they would participate in the UN General Assembly virtually this year, rather than comply with New York's 14-day self-isolation period for visitors. The White House has not yet submitted a pre-recorded speech for the Assembly. The UN has asked that countries submit these videos by Friday. The Trump administration is still likely to spark tension, however, with its demand that the UN reinstate sanctions on Iran that were in place prior to the 2015 nuclear deal. Trump has threatened to try and trigger what's known as a snapback provision within that nuclear deal, despite having withdrawn the US from it in 2018. The meeting will be clouded by Trump's administration's broadsides on the UN bodies such as WHO, UNESCO, the patchy global response to the coronavirus pandemic, and an ongoing failure of UN member countries to stay on track with the body's sustainable development goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. On Monday, world leaders will deliver speeches marking the UN's successes and failures. The U.S., as host, is set to deliver the first speech. Steve Hank Professor of Applied Economics at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore and Senior Fellow and Director of the Troubled Currencies Project at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., uses high-frequency data coupled with a purchasing power parity model to show definitively countries in which the annual inflation rate exceeded 25% per year. According to his readings, on August 31st, 12 countries had annual inflation rates that exceeded 25% per year. Venezuela is hyperinflating and sits on top of the list with an annual inflation rate of 1,347% per year. Zimbabwe is second with an annual inflation rate of 706% per year. Lebanon comes in third with an annual inflation rate of 337% per year. Iran sits down on the list at 111% inflation. By 2030, Google plans to precisely match every electron of electricity flowing into its offices and data centers with one produced from a renewable source. If someone clicks on a search at 3 a.m., Google will find the electricity to power that query from a battery, wind turbine, solar panel, hydroelectric dam, or some other carbon-free technology at that precise moment. That goal, announced on September 14th, would make Google the first major company to run its entire business on carbon-free energy around the clock. If the history of renewable energy is any guide, this could have an industry-shifting impact on the market for energy storage and batteries. The following are remarks by President Trump on the repatriation of Native American artifacts and remains that took place on September 17th. President Trump Nearly 130 years ago, treasured Native American artifacts were excavated from the great state of Colorado by European archaeologists. For the past seven decades, several administrations have tried, and they've tried very hard, they were unable to do it, to negotiate the return of these precious artifacts. Last October, I worked with the president of Finland, who agreed to bring these priceless possessions back to the 26 Indian tribes of the Mesa Verde region in the American Southwest and they've been trying to get it for a long time, so we got it done. Five days ago, the remains were repatriated to their ancestral homeland and given a proper burial, and this was with big ceremony. My administration also brought back the Acoma Pueblo Shield to New Mexico last November, and that was very important to the great people of New Mexico. Ambassador Pence said this, And most importantly, to the tribes, there are 26. There were four repatriating tribes, the Acoma, the Hopi, the Zia, and the Zuni, who were designated to represent all of the tribes. And lastly, I would like to say, but without Finnair and American Airlines, who actually put on a bigger plane to get these 12 cartons of human remains and funerary objects on those planes, we would not have been able to pull this off. So I thank them. It's been a team effort. Federal prosecutors accused a group of hackers based in China and Malaysia with cyber attacks targeting more than 100 companies, government agencies, and nonprofits worldwide in charges unsealed Wednesday. The hackers are accused of being a part of a China based hacking operation called APT 41, also known as Barium. Two Malaysian businessmen were arrested Monday in connection with the cyber attacks, according to prosecutors. Five more defendants are believed to still be in China and have not been arrested. 
Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, Google, and Verizon assisted the government in its investigation. Prosecutors say the group worked to steal intellectual property while simultaneously running ransomware attacks for profit, and that between 2014 and 2020, the defendants allegedly targeted social media companies, video game companies, nonprofits, universities, think tanks, and foreign governments, as well as pro democracy activists in Hong Kong, but didn't name the firms or agencies that were targeted. COVID-19 patients in Austria showed signs of lung damage six weeks after they left the hospital, but many patients saw their CT scans of their lungs improve after 12 weeks. The research confirms that the virus can produce long-lasting physical damage, but it also suggests that patients' lungs might be capable of healing over time. That's good news for the growing share of COVID-19 patients whose recovery processes have lasted long beyond their hospital visits. Patients who have trouble breathing don't always have signs of damage on their CT scans, and patients with abnormal lung scans may not have trouble breathing. Physical therapy can speed up this recovery process for COVID-19 patients with lung damage. As one doctor puts it, there's not a medication to make your lungs stronger. The only way to make them stronger is by using them. Every time you do some exercise and so forth, more blood flow goes to the lungs. More blood flow means more healing cells will come to heal the parts that are damaged. Republican Governor Mike DeWine signed a law Wednesday that bans local or state officials from ordering all houses of worship in the state or in a particular geographic region to close. The purpose of House Bill 272 is to protect Ohioans' freedom of religion in the future, says Senator Terry Johnson, a co-sponsor of the bill. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen several states encroach on America's First Amendment right of worship and assembly, disregarding it completely by forcing the closure of places of worship and religious institutions, Johnson said. While I am thankful that no such order was imposed in Ohio, this amendment is a preemptive step should we ever find ourselves in this situation again. The law goes into effect this winter when, according to some infectious disease experts, a second wave of coronavirus cases and deaths could hit the U.S. Nearly a year after President Trump pulled a small group of U.S. Special Forces from Syria, a United Nations report makes clear the damage to the Kurds and Arabs that America left behind. On Trump's orders, the small group of U.S. Special Forces that had served as a buffer between the U.S.-aligned Kurdish militia and the Turkish army left their posts last year, clearing the way for a Turkish invasion. That decision forced Kurdish troops, which had done most of the fighting to destroy Islamic State's caliphate, to align with Damascus in Syria's civil war, and by extension Russia and Iran. The report singles out the Islamic militia known as the Syrian National Army for actions that likely amount to war crimes. Three of its brigades repeatedly pillaged and have also been credibly accused of the torture and rape of detainees. The report also notes allegations that Turkish forces were aware of the looting and appropriation of civilian property and that they were present in detention facilities run by the Syrian National Army where during interrogation sessions torture took place. The tragedy here is that this betrayal of the Kurds that fought and died to destroy the Islamic State in Syria could have been avoided. At a very low cost, the U.S. was able to train and assist a fighting force in northern Syria, something larger regional powers such as Turkey, Iran, and Russia proved unable to do. And for the few years that Turkey was kept away from the autonomous zone in northern Syria, Kurds were able to live in relative peace and prosperity compared to the rest of the country. The initial line from the White House last year was that Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan had told Trump that his forces were invading the Turkish region and that the U.S. had no choice but to leave. But Trump never threatened economic sanctions or other penalties if the Turkish president went through with it. He accepted the president of Turkey's word and used it as an opportunity to end another endless war. Today, the Kurdish civilians who allied with the U.S. against jihadists are at the mercy of jihadists aligned with Turkey. That will be all for today. To read more on any of these topics, see the sources in our description below. Subscribe to receive a daily news update. Thank you for listening. Be relaxed. Be informed. Be connected.